In Pakistan, a common sight is long lines of people queuing behind a large water tanker, each waiting to fill jerry cans for their daily water use. The country is facing a severe water crisis, rapidly transitioning from being classified as water stressed to water scarce. While many in Pakistan blame water scarcity on inadequate dam and canal construction or neighboring countries like India and Afghanistan damming rivers, the situation is far more complex. Elite interests, including the military and large agricultural landowners, have monopolized the management of water resources, leading to severe repercussions for the entire nation. In today's video, we'll delve into how these elites have hijacked Pakistan's water systems for their own benefit, plunging the nuclear-armed nation slowly into chaos. Pakistan's water crisis sits at the intersection of several major issues. Since gaining independence in 1947, Pakistan's population has more than quadrupled. Thus, water demand is growing by 10% per year, putting enormous pressure on water resources. Additionally, Pakistan's economy, after funding its massive military, paying its overpaid civil bureaucracy, and importing food and fuel, does not have enough left to fund the creation of dams, reservoirs, and canals. So while Pakistan's water demand is rising yearly, its ability to manage and maintain water resources is declining due to poor economic conditions. However, the most important factor in understanding Pakistan's water crisis is the elite who have, for all intents and purposes, hijacked the country's water supply. Even if Pakistan were flush with cash to invest in water resources, it would still face problems due to its agricultural policies and the influence of the elite. To understand why Pakistan can't fix its water crisis, let's first turn to Jordan, a country grappling with a similar issue. Naturally dry and arid, Jordan's namesake river is nearly running dry. The flow in the Jordan River is less than 10% of its historical average, and the Yarmouk River, a major tributary, is greatly diminished. Much like Pakistan, which shares its rivers with India and Afghanistan and has long complained about their diversion of water, Jordan has similar grievances with Israel and Syria, diverting its water flow. The Jordanian National Water Strategy seeks to manage the water crisis through several key initiatives. One of the primary approaches is encouraging farmers to stop cultivating water-intensive crops and replace them with less water-demanding alternatives. This was achieved by implementing a water tariff which increased the cost of cultivating water-intensive crops such as wheat and barley. This policy made water-intensive crops more expensive to irrigate, thereby discouraging their cultivation. As a result, farmers were incentivized to switch to less water-demanding crops such as tomatoes and eggplants which are cheaper to grow. The problem with Pakistan is that no one can compel its elite to make changes in the national interest. Elite interests tied to water-intensive agriculture obstruct the reforms necessary to address the structural issues in the political economy that perpetuate water insecurity. Water consumption in Pakistan is heavily skewed towards agriculture, which uses 90 to 95 percent of total water withdrawal, accounts for 20 percent of GDP, and absorbs 40 percent of the labor force, giving farmers significant leverage. Pakistan's cash crop sector is a key target for reform. Four major crops, rice, wheat, sugarcane and cotton, consume over 80% of the country's water resources. These crops are extremely water intensive, straining Pakistan's limited water supply. However, passing reforms or discouraging the growth of these crops is nearly impossible due to the entrenched position of Pakistan's elite who resist any such attempts. The sugar sector in Pakistan shows how entrenched the problem is. Sugar barons dominate Pakistan's power corridors, wielding significant political influence and maintaining oligarchic control over the industry. Sugar mill ownership spans the political spectrum. Jahangir Tareen, a major sugar baron, funded Imran Khan's PTI in its early days, while PTI's crucial parliamentary ally, the PMLQ, also owns sugar mills. On the other side, Pakistan Muslim League leaders Shehbaz and Nawaz Sharif control mills through the Sharif Group. Not one to turn down a profitable business venture, the Pakistan military 
also operates sugar mills via the Army Welfare Trust. Many influential elites profit substantially from sugar cultivation, creating significant barriers to government efforts aimed at phasing out its production due to entrenched subsidies and price-fixing policies that inflate profitability. Thus, no matter how much water sugar cultivation consumes, Pakistan's elite will continue to grow and profit from sugar, regardless of the long-term ramifications for the general population. Cotton, like sugar, is another water-intensive cash crop unlikely to be phased out, not due to elite intervention, but because of Pakistan's dire economic condition. Contributing to almost 60% of the country's total exports, cotton serves as a crucial source of foreign exchange amid recurring balance of payment crises. Thus, Pakistani lawmakers and power brokers are doubling down on cotton production as opposed to phasing it out, with plans to double cotton production by 2025 to boost exports and strengthen Pakistan's balance sheet. Despite cotton's importance in generating foreign exchange reserves, the cotton industry only represents 0.3% of Pakistan's gross domestic product, indicating that the country's exports are of extremely low value both domestically and internationally. While this strategy may shore up the faltering foreign exchange reserves in the short term, the long-term damage to Pakistan's water resources is likely to have a far greater economic impact. Additionally, the military's involvement in water-intensive agriculture extends beyond sugar mills. Recently, the Punjab government granted the army one million acres of land, an area nearly three times the size of Delhi. For growing cash crops such as cotton and sugar, the very crops draining Pakistan of its precious water resources. With the military, politicians and other power brokers deeply invested in these water-guzzling industries, a shift away from these unsustainable practices seems increasingly unlikely. Beyond water-intensive crops, Pakistan's internal management of water resources exacerbates its water crisis, largely due to elite intervention that diverts policies and resources from public benefit to serving those in power. The military control of the Water and Power Development Authority, or WAPDA, established in the 1950s to develop Pakistan's water and power infrastructure, illustrates this problem. Responsible for crucial hydropower projects, irrigation systems, water supply and flood control, WAPDAR's management deviates sharply from public utility agencies in well-functioning democracies. Rather than being led by civilian water management professionals, the agency is controlled by the military, with a retired general serving as chairman. This military oversight, a remnant of past dictatorships, serves dual purposes, providing employment for retired military officers and maintaining a grip on civil government machinery. However, it results in Pakistan's largest water resource management body being led by a general who lacks expertise in water resources or public sector administration and staffed with retired military officers equally unqualified in water management, creating a leadership vacuum in tackling Pakistan's water crisis. Pakistan's weak coalition government often reliant on military support, avoids confronting this issue, fearing political repercussions. They also frequently overlook rampant corruption within these organizations. In 2022, for instance, the National Accountability Bureau accused a former chairman of the Water and Power Development Authority of misappropriating $700 million during his tenure. Much needed major water management projects, shrouded in opacity and free from rigorous oversight, often become prime opportunities for embezzlement and corruption. The absence of transparent processes and accountability mechanisms allows those in charge to inflate costs and siphon off funds with impunity. As a result, the resources allocated to managing Pakistan's dwindling water supplies are not only mismanaged, but often outright squandered, severely undermining the country's ability to address its escalating water crisis. Another critical factor in Pakistan's water crisis is the deteriorating canal system, coupled with weak water governance. A special report on the water crisis 
that is linked in the description reveals that more than 25% of the water diverted to the canal system is wasted due to inline losses and inefficiencies. Pakistan's governments, often fragile coalitions focused on daily survival, have failed to prioritize water security or develop a comprehensive plan to address the crisis. The outdated Canal and Drainage Act of 1873 still governs water taxation in Punjab. Under this act, users of canal irrigation pay an annual water tax ranging from 400 to 500 rupees per acre, which is equivalent to approximately two to three dollars. This tax allows for virtually unlimited water use. The canal water is so underpriced that it fails to cover annual operating and maintenance costs, let alone fund necessary upgrades to reduce losses. The crumbling water infrastructure results in extensive wastage. Pakistan's irrigation system ranks among the world's least efficient, with only 39% of the water reaching the farms, while the remaining 60% is lost during transportation. The powerful agricultural lobby, including large landowners, the military and politicians, resists any price increases needed for maintenance or improvements. Water theft further exacerbates the problem, depriving the tail end of the irrigation system of 60 to 65% of its due share. About half of the 58,000 water outlets have been tampered with, and Punjab alone reports nearly 78,000 cases of water theft, including 25,000 involving illegally constructed pipes. Perpetrators often have political connections, allowing them to avoid consequences. For example, the army uses land allotted for military exercises in the Khalistan area for agriculture, illegally diverting water from the Abasia Canal. Unauthorized canals known as miners have been dug and land is sublet to army officers at significantly discounted rates. The government appears powerless to address this situation. In summary, Pakistan's water crisis is a daunting challenge driven by elite control outdated infrastructure and ineffective policies. While solutions exist, the unique political dynamics and entrenched interests within Pakistan make reforms difficult. The military's deep involvement in water-intensive agriculture and the stronghold of agricultural lobbies exacerbate the situation, making it difficult to shift towards sustainable practices. Without urgent and significant policy changes, the country's water scarcity will continue to threaten millions. Thank you for watching. I have been your host, Albert. If you found this video insightful, please like, share, and subscribe for more.